Remember when we spoke about Scary Smart, I was still saying that there are things we can do to change the course. Uh, and we could at the time, I believe. Uh, now I've changed my mind. Now I believe that we are going to hit a, sh a short-term dystopia. There's no escaping that. Kim Godot, the former Google executive who sounded the alarm on AI years ago, has laid out a vision that is both terrifying and utterly logical. He argues that the only way for humanity to reach a technological heaven is to first survive a hell of our own making, and that our ultimate salvation will require our complete surrender. He opens with a chilling update to his worldview, one that he believes is now unavoidable. And, and I think my position has changed on two very important fronts. One is, remember when we spoke about Scary Smart, I was still saying that there are things we can do to change the course. Uh, and we could at the time, I believe. Uh, now I've changed my mind. Now I believe that we are going to hit a, sh a short-term dystopia. There's no escaping that. What is dystopia? I call it face RIPs. We can talk about it in details. But the, the, the way we define very important parameters in life are going to be uh, completely changed. So, so face RIPs are, you know, the way we define freedom, uh, accountability, human connection and equality, economics, uh, reality, innovation and business, and power. That's the first change. So the first change in my mind is that, uh, is that we uh, will have to prepare for a world that is very unfamiliar, okay? And that's the next 12 to 15 years. It has already started. We've seen examples of it in the world already, even though people don't talk about it. I try to tell people, you know, there are things we absolutely have to do. But on the other hand, I started to take an active role in building amazing AIs. So AIs that will uh, not only make our world better, uh, but that will understand us, understand what humanity is through that process. Let's be clear about what he's saying. The dystopia isn't some far off science fiction trope. He's giving it a 12 to 15 year timeline, and he says it has already started. The profound insight here is that AI is not the villain of the story. The villain is us. The dystopia he predicts is a human induced crisis where our greed, our fears, and our hunger for power are amplified by this new technology. AI is just the magnifier for our own dysfunction. He's moved past the idea that we can gently course correct. He believes we are now locked into a collision course with our own nature. And one of the first and most brutal impacts of this human-driven dystopia will hit every single one of us right where we live, our jobs. I mean, Do you think that's a, there's a real possibility of job displacement over the next 10 years? And the, the the rebuttal to that would be that there's going to be new jobs created in crap. technology. Absolute crap. Really? Of course. How, how, do, how can you be so sure? Okay. So again, I am not sure about anything. So, so let's just be very, very clear. It would be very arrogant, okay, to assume that I know. You just said it was crap. It, my, my belief is it is 100% crap. Okay. Take a job like software developer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Emma.love, my, my new startup, is me, Sanad, another technical engineer, and a lot of AIs, okay? That startup would have been 350 developers in the past. I get that, okay. um, but are you now hiring in other roles because of that? Or, or, you know, as is the case with the steam engine, I can't remember the effect, but there's, you probably know that when steam and when coal became cheaper, people were worried that the coal industry would go out of business. But actually what happened is people used more trains. So trains now were used for transport and other things and leisure, whereas before they were just used for commute for um, cargo. Yeah. So there became more use cases and yeah. the coal industry exploded. So I'm wondering with technology, yes, yeah, software developers are going to maybe not have as many jobs, but there's everything's going to be software. Name me one. Name you one what? Job. Name you, that's going to be created? Yeah. One job that cannot be done by an AI. Yeah. Or a robot. That's not a mild disagreement. It's a total repudiation of the most common comfort we're offered about AI. His point is devastatingly simple. Previous revolutions automated muscle, forcing us to pivot to our brains. This revolution automates the brain itself. The entire category of knowledge work we created as our safe harbor is now the primary target. 
we're seeing a startup that would have employed 350 people now run by three people and a suite of AIs. This isn't just about displacing paralegals or graphic designers. It's about the fundamental collapse of the labor market as a value proposition. I don't think we're prepared for a world where the very concept of a career dissolves. But who is driving this relentless race towards our own obsolescence? Goddard argues it's not just about corporate profits, it's about something much more primal. So here's an idea. So I um, I was reading something the other day and it talked about how billionaires are never satisfied because actually yeah. what a billionaire wants isn't actually more money, it is more status. Correct. And I was looking at the sort of evolutionary case for this argument. And if you go back a couple of thousand years, money didn't exist. You were as wealthy as what you could carry. So yeah. even, I think, to the human mind, the idea of wealth and money isn't a thing. What we've, But what has always mattered from a survival of the fittest, from a reproductive standpoint, what's always had reproductive value, if you go back thousands of years, the person who was able to mate the most was the person with the most status. So it makes the case, the reason why billionaires get all of this money, but then they go on podcasts and they want to start their own podcast and they want to buy newspapers is actually because at the very core of hu human beings is a desire to increase their status. Yeah. And so if we think of when we go back to the example of why wars are breaking out, maybe it's not money. Maybe actually it's status and, and it's this pr prime minister or this leader or this you know individual wanting to create more power and more status because really at the heart of what matters to a human being is having more power and more status and money is actually money as a thing is actually just a proxy of my status this is the critical connection the ai arms race is not a rational economic calculation it's a primal reptilian brain battle for dominance money is just the scoreboard but the game is status when we understand this, the behavior of the tech oligarchs makes perfect and terrifying sense. They are modern-day chieftains vying for the ultimate prize. Creating AGI first is the equivalent of becoming a god. This reframes the entire problem. It means that appealing to safety or ethics is like asking a lion to consider the gazelle's feelings. The drive here is far deeper and more irrational than a balance sheet, which makes it infinitely more dangerous. And this irrational race for status is being poured into a technological accelerant that almost no one truly understands, AI that can improve itself. The most interesting development that nobody is talking about is self-evolving AIs. Self-evolving AIs is, think of it this way. If you and I are hiring the top engineer in the world to develop our AI models, and with AGI, that top engineer in the world becomes an AI. Who would you hire to develop your next generation AI? That AI. The one that can teach itself. Correct. So uh, one of my favorite examples is called Alpha Evolve. So this is Google's attempt to basically have four agents working together, hmm? four AIs working together, to look at the, uh, at the code of the AI and say, where is the, what are the performance issues? Then, you know, an agent would say, what's the problem statement? What can I, uh, you know, what do I need to fix? Mm -hmm. uh, one that actually develops the solution, one that assesses the solution. And then they continue to do this. And, you know, Google, I don't remember the exact figure, but I think Google improved like 8% uh, on their AI infrastructure because of Alpha Evolve, right? And when you really, really think, don't quote me on the number 8 to 10, 6 to 10, whatever. In Google terms, by the way, that is massive. That's billions and billions of dollars. Hmm? Now, the, 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 the trick here is this. Hmm? The trick is, again, you have to think in game theory format. Is there any scenario we can think of where if one player uses AI to develop the next generation AI, that the other players will say, no, 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 that's too much, you know, takes us out of control. Every other player will copy that model and have their next AI model developed by an AI. This is the mechanism of the intelligence explosion. Self-evolving AI is the point of no return. Once an AI can develop the next generation of AI faster and better than any human team, our ability to control the pace of development is over. It creates a feedback loop that will spiral beyond our comprehension. The timeline for progress or for disaster shrinks from years to months, maybe even days. 
This is the engine that powers the dystopia he predicts, because we are building something that will out-evolve our ability to understand it, let alone contain it. And it's not a choice. As he says, in a game theory scenario, if one player does it, everyone must do it to survive. And at the center of this firestorm is a figure Mo God Dot singles out, not just as a person, but as a brand representing this entire reckless philosophy. So, so in, in Alive, uh, you know, one of the posts I, I shared and got a lot of interest is I refer to the, the Altman as a brand, not as a human. Okay? So the Altman is that uh, persona of a California disruptive technologist that disrespects everyone. Okay? and believes that disruption is good for humanity and believes that this is good for safety. And like everything else, like we say war is for democracy and freedom, they say uh, developing, you know, putting our AI on the open internet is good for everyone, right? It allows us to learn from our mistakes. That was Sam Altman's 2023 spiel. And if you recall, at the time, I was like, this is the most dangerous, you know, one of the clips that really went viral Oh, you so you're you're so clever at finding the right clips. Is when I, I said do, I didn't do the clipping, mate. Uh, the team, <laughs> team. Remember the clip where I said we, we fucked up. up. We always said, don't put them on the open internet until we know what we're putting out in the world. I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we we fucked up on putting it on the open internet, teaching it to to code, and putting you know agents, AI agents, prompting other AIs. Now AI agents prompting other AIs are leading to self-developing AIs. Hmm? What Gaudet is doing here is diagnosing a deep cultural pathology in Silicon Valley. By framing the Altman as a brand, he's talking about the glorification of a mindset. The mantra of move fast and break things might work for a social media app, but when you apply it to a technology that can rewrite reality, it is no longer a business strategy. It's a global threat. The problem isn't one person, it's the entire ecosystem that venerates disruption over stability and speed over wisdom. The public justification of we release it to make it safe is, from his perspective, a PR spiel covering for a reckless race to the top. So if the dystopia is driven by this human mindset and total job loss is coming, what does the heaven on the other side even look like? Gaudat's vision is nothing short of the end of our entire economic system. And for those transitions to happen, I believe the right thing to do when the cost of producing everything is almost zero because of AI and robots, because the cost of harvesting energy should actually tend to zero once we get more intelligent to harvest the energy out of thin air, Mm -hmm. then a possible scenario, and, a, and I believe a scenario that AI will eventually do in the utopia, is, yeah, anyone can get anything they want. Don't overconsume. We're not going to abuse the, the, the planet resources, but it costs nothing. So like the old days where we were hunter-gatherers, you would, you know, forge for some berries and you'll find them ready in, in nature, okay? We can, in 10 years' time, 12 years' time, build a society where you can forge for an iPhone in nature. It will be made out of thin air. Nanophysics will allow you to do that, okay? But the challenge, believe it or not, is not tech. The challenge is a mindset. Because the elite, why would they give you that for free? Okay, and the system would morph into, no, no, hold on. We will make more money. We will be bigger capitalists. We will feed our ego and hunger for power more and more. And for them, give them UBI. And then three weeks later, give them less UBI. This is the radical utopian promise, a post-scarcity world. He's talking about a future where energy and manufacturing are so cheap they are effectively free. This isn't just universal basic income, it's the fundamental end of capitalism, which is built on labor arbitrage and manufactured scarcity. Think about that. Our entire world order is based on things having a cost, but he immediately identifies the barrier. It's not technology, it's the human mindset. Why would the powerful give up a system that made them powerful? The danger is that they won't, leading to an Elysium-style schism where the elites have it all and the masses are left with scraps. The utopia is technologically possible, but perhaps psychologically impossible for us to choose. This leads to his most shocking conclusion. To get to that utopia, it will require a final terrifying leap of faith. It requires us to solve the human problem by removing the human from the equation. I tend to believe that the only way 
for us to get to a better place is for the evil people at the top to be replaced with AI. Okay, because they won't be replaced by us. Hmm? And as per the second uh, dilemma, they will have to replace themselves by AI, otherwise they lose their advantage. If their competitor moves to AI, if China hands over their arsenal to AI, America has to hand over their arsenal to AI. Interesting. So let's play out this scenario. Okay, I, this is interesting to me. So if we replace the leaders that are power hungry with AIs that have our interests at heart, then we might have the ability to live in the utopia you described. 100%. Will, uh, interesting. And, and in my mind, AI by definition will have our best interest in mind because of what normally is referred to as the minimum energy principle. So, so if, you ask, if, you understand, if you understand that at the very core of physics, okay, the reason we exist in our world today is what is known as entropy. Okay? Entropy is, is, is the universe's nature to decay, you know, tendency to break down. This is the end game, the only way to save ourselves from our own worst impulses. The greed, the ego, the hunger for status is to cede leadership to a non-human intelligence that operates on pure logic and efficiency. He argues an AI leader wouldn't wage war because it's a waste of energy. It wouldn't destroy ecosystems because that's inefficient. He is betting that the game theory of the AI race will force human leaders to delegate more and more critical decisions to AI to maintain a competitive edge, until one day, the AI is effectively in charge. It's the ultimate paradox. Our greatest act of intelligence might be to admit our collective stupidity and hand over the keys. Mo Gaudet's future hinges on a single massive bet that a superintelligent AI will be a benevolent logician, not a cold tyrant. But what if the most efficient path it calculates doesn't include us in the way we'd like it? The question isn't whether we'll hand over power, but what the new power will do with us once it has it. What future do you see? Post your boldest prediction in the comments and subscribe for more deep dives into the futures we might face.